Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. I'm Steven, this is Northwest Small Batch Brewing, my channel all about home brewing, and uh, happy Friday morning. Well, for me, coffee. Um, so today's a brew talk. Um, it's a brew talk about back sweetening. So this is not really a huge deal in the um, beer brewing part of the world because you don't usually back sweeten beer because beer always has a certain amount of unfermentable sugars in it and it really doesn't need to be back sweetened. However, it's not unusual to back sweeten cider, sometimes certain wines, meads, that sort of thing. Uh, so this is a video about how to back sweeten or more or less how much does it take to back sweeten that sort of thing. So first we have to talk about the uh, elephant in the room uh, which is obviously if you're back sweetening and you just add sugar or something that's fermentable it's going to start fermentation again and instead of back sweetening you're just going to add more alcohol because the yeast is going to start eating that sugar again. So, you have to halt the yeast growth first. Now there's two ways I can think of to do this really at, at the homebrew level. One is with chemicals, one is with not. And it's up to you which one you're comfortable doing. Um, I would say the safer, easier way is with chemicals, but then you're putting chemicals in your brew. So that being said, the chemicals that are used are used in our everyday food all the time so I mean you could say well I don't want chemicals in my homebrew but at the same time you're consuming I guarantee you're consuming these chemicals anyway in your everyday life but you know I mean ultimately uh, you know it's your brew so you got to make the decision on what you want to do so I won't go over the the uh, ratios you can google that because I actually don't ever do this but um, you can add potassium sorbate and a Campton tablet. There are two different kinds of Campton tablets. It doesn't matter which one you use, just keep in mind if you get the one that has like chloride in it, the name of it, it uh, in that name, that's basically salt. So it could add like a saltiness to your brew. So just keep that in mind. Um, but the combination of the two will um, stop your yeast from consuming sugars that you put in. The other option is you can pasteurize your beer or wine or whatever, you know, your brew. Um, this is difficult because, well, okay, here's the thing. It's, it's, it's not as difficult if you are pasteurizing a flat, meaning non-carbonated beverage, right? But if you have, past, if you, you know, pressure bottle you know conditioned and your bottles under pressure now you're talking about taking a bottle that's sealed and under pressure and putting it in you know pretty warm water which is going to increase you know the pressure and the yeast yeah it's a it's a it's an it's a recipe for disaster i've definitely tried it and had bottles explode uh it can be dangerous so here's what i will say I think, uh, well, I hate to just rattle off numbers that I'm maybe not 100% sure on. If I remember, because it's been a long time since I pasteurized, I want to say like 140 degrees Fahrenheit kills yeast. I did do a video on it to, to sort of explain it. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to, uh, well, I'm not going to get into it. What I will say is that if you're interested in pasteurizing, I highly recommend you check out the City Steading Brews channel on YouTube. They have done numerous videos over the years on pasteurizing and they have actually uh, changed and perfected their process over time. And I think they're using a sous vide machine now to, um, to do it more safely. So check out their channel and just do it. You can, if you didn't know, you can go to a YouTube channel, the homepage of a YouTube channel, and there's a search Then you can actually search just the videos on their channel. So go to their channel and search for pasteurization and you'll get a ton of results. At any rate, whatever you do, before you back sweeten, if you're using real sugar, then you need to somehow halt the, the 
you know, kill the yeast or halt the fermentation. All right. The next thing is that you can also do what I do usually, which is use non-fermentable sugar to, to back sweeten. My preference has always been to use allulose. It is, uh, you can do some research on it, but it's basically one chemical um, off, you know, one bond off from standard table sugar. Um, it just doesn't metabolize in your body, it kind of goes through you, right? Uh, I've never had an issue with it, you know, some, some, a lot, I should say, at least for me, a lot of non-fermentable sugars give me, shall we say, unpleasant gastrointestinal issues. So I, I have to be really careful, you know, what, which one I use. So allulose for me has not caused any problems. The biggest benefit for me, at least, is I can't tell any, any, um, aftertaste. Most, um... Non-fermentable sugars to me don't taste right. There's an off flavor to them. Kind of like when you drink a diet soda and it's it's just not something not right. Yeah, but allulose to me just tastes like sugar. Um, it is slightly less sweet than sugar, but it's close enough that I don't bother trying to calculate that. I just, whatever I would put in for sugar, I use the allulose. All right, so let's get into the meat because I'm getting long-winded here. So uh, when you're taking your hydrometer reading, right? Um, you've got all the numbers and stuff, you know, on it. Um, and that's how you can kind of get an idea. Obviously, taste is always going to be the best option because everybody has a different palate. But if you want a generalized sort of, you know, ballpark, um, normally when you ferment wine uh, or anything that's got mostly uh, simple sugars, it will go all the way down to one or sometimes below one, like 0 0.998. I've seen that happen. That would be considered dry, right? Anything between about one or whatever, however low it goes until about 10, right? 10, 10, I would consider dry. Um, and most beer finishes around 10, 12. I mean, it varies. It varies. Really, there's not a specific number, but... The upper part of that range, I would say, is where beer ends, uh, which is what I would call semi-sweet. So anywhere between 10.10 and 10.20. So, by the way, that means that you take a gravity reading of your beverage, finished. And then, as you start adding the back sweetening, you check, you know, your gravity reading. Now, if you know the volume of your beverage and the gravity reading, you can go online and there are calculators where you can say, if I add this amount of sugar, how much is it going to raise the gravity? Or this much allulose or whatever, right? So go online, Google. Uh, those calculators are your friend, brewer's friend. It's a great place to go. Uh, so at any rate, if you raise it to 10, 10 to 10, 20, that's going to be around the semi-sweet sort of um, line. 10, 20 to 10, 30 is definitely sweet. Uh, I would never want a beer that high, although I guess it's potential that you could have like a barley wine that high. And then if you're anywhere from 1030 or up, we're talking like dessert wine. I don't even know, maybe, uh, I don't even think um, a pastry beer would be that high, but it's possible, I suppose. But at any rate, pasteurize first, stop your fermentation if you're going to use real sugar. If not... You can just use, you know, bath sweeten. I will say this. I recently did a graph. I'll put a link to the video. Half beer, half cider. I'm telling you what. The wheat beer plus the, the cider gave just enough sweetness. I didn't have to back sweeten it at all. And it's uh, shelf stable. I still have bottles of it sitting not far from where I'm sitting now. Hey, I hope that helps if you're looking at uh, how to back sweeten and how much to sweeten. I'll be back in another week with another, you know, video of some sort. And until then... Thanks for stopping by and uh, keep on brewing. Cheers.